point I want us to look at here is very important for us to implement. Whose speech do we accept or reject? Your narrators are in question on social media. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The chain of narration is a special trait for this ummah. It's what safeguards us from circulating false speech and practicing false beliefs. Allah has preserved Islam through the link of the Isnad. Abdullah bin Mubarak, who died 181 Hijra, he said, the Isnad is part of the religion. If there was no Isnad, then anyone could say anything. During the era of the companions, the narrators were trustworthy and upright. After their lifetime, obstacles blocked the path to accept the speech of every Muslim. Accepting and relating the speech from others required one to act with caution. Ibn Sirin said, the scholars of Hadith didn't used to ask about the chain of narration. When the fitna occurred, they would question others by asking, tell us the names of your men. Following this, they would look at Ahlul Sunnah and accept their Hadith. Along with this, they would look towards Ahlul Bid'ah and reject their Hadith. Let's pause here for a second. The fitna in that period forced them to be on alert. So what about today, my brothers? A time when every time Dick and Harry can express himself. Social media channels allow them to speak. We have unfit missionaries taking the minbar, opening blogs, opening YouTube channels, monitoring forums today. And this is today's epidemic. Ibn Surin said this knowledge is religion, so pay attention to who you learn from. Islam is a religion with the narration of reports through an isnad. This isnad must be intact before we can act or believe the report. Can we accept reports from anonymous relators? Should we convey news broadcasted from notorious sinners? Is it just so simple to retell an event from a person with a fictitious account and accept it to be factual? The following points address the social ills affecting Muslims through viral communications. These points are built on solid foundations. Some principles from the scholars of Al Hadith are briefly discussed. So, scholars of fiqh and hadith collectively argue, agree, the conditions to accept a person's narrations are four. The relator is a Muslim in the age of puberty with sound intellect and not known as a sinner. He should not do things that contradict the social norms of his society. A person's integrity can be in question if he goes against the social norms from his community. Next, the Muslim must be precise when he narrates the speech from others. Being accurate is either from the memory or from the place it's recorded. Along with this, if he narrates reports by their meaning, they must be error free. These are the requirements for a person to be considered reliable. So let's take each condition and look at it in a few words. We use these conditions to relay the speech of the Prophet ﷺ, the scholars, or retell an event. Pay close to these attentions, my brothers, so that you cannot be misled into the turmoils and the epidemic of spreading false information that's so prevalent today from the news stations and from social media. Condition number one, the narrator must be Muslim. This removes the narration of a kafir. We reject the narration of a disbeliever according to the consensus of the jurist. Condition two, the reporter must be an adult, not a child, even if he has reached the age of discernment, which is the age of seven. We are able to accept the report of a child if he narrates it after puberty. Condition number three, the Muslim adult delivering the speech of others must be of sound mind. Sound mind is when a person is sane, awake in conscience. The individual asleep, crazy, and unconscious isn't attentive. The narrative of a person who heard information while he was absent-minded is rejected. And condition number four, the narrator isn't known for his disobedience to a law or acts of oppression towards people. A judge denies the sinner's testimony in court, reason being he's not righteous and honest, so his speech remains in question. <coughs> a sinner 
isn't called trustworthy. A sinner is the person known to commit major sins or regularly practice minor ones. We ask Allah for his safety. If this is the case of a narrator in Allah's deen, then his speech and testimony are of no value. Any act that causes people to doubt a person's integrity must be shunned. Those are the primary issues, my brothers and sisters, when dealing with the exposure of news and reports from others. These four conditions allow you and I to accept their information. Scholars have discussed this topic in their books for Hadith terminology in detail. This isn't the proper place right now to discuss it and go into detail, but the following subjects discuss narrations who are able to reject. So we reject narration reports from liars. If the experience of the world is worth anything, we are certain a liar cannot be trusted. A liar is a person who informs others about speech and events in an imaginary way. These are different categories. There are different categories of lying. Fabricating information about Allah and his messenger is the most atrocious. The hadiths that warn against this heinous act are galore in the sunnah. Reporting things about people which aren't true is also a major sin. Forging information results in a punishment in this life and in the next. The retribution for the liar in this life is the rejection of his narratives. Imam Mubarak said, the punishment for the liar is his truth isn't accepted. So think about this, brothers. We have people who on social media who we don't know who they are. Some of, many of these people will never even meet them. You and I can't even vouch for their integrity, yet they spread reports, and sometimes we like it, sometimes we share it. We're falling into a blameworthy act here, my brothers. Sufyan Athori said, Whoever lies will become covered with shame. When a person fabricates information from someone he never met, this is intentional. That report is dismissed as well as future narrations that he narrates until he repents. If he repents after being exposed, then his speech is accepted. If he recants saying, I made a mistake, or I misinformed you about X, Y, Z, you must accept them from him. Those words show sincerity and honesty, and Allah knows best. Sincerity and honesty make it a must to accept his retraction and narrations. The narration from a noted sinner. The noted sinner is a person who acts immorally or has strayed from the right course. The noted sinner here is a person whose sins don't take him out of the fold of Islam. This sinner isn't a person known to lie on the Prophet. The word used in the Quran to describe the disobedient or disbeliever is fasiq. A fasiq abandons obligations and does prohibitions. The scholars agree a noted sinner's statement or account is rejected. Ibn Arabi said, talk and information from a noted sinner isn't accepted. There is a consensus and ijma on this position. Conveying information is a trust and sins weakens a person's trustworthiness. Ashanqiti said, Allah said, O oh, you who believe, if a rebellious evil person comes to you with news, verify it. In Surah Al-Hujurat, this verse proves we reject known sinners' reports. Allah also informs us that an evildoer's testimony is dismissed in court. Allah said, and reject their testimony forever. They indeed are the fasiqun, liars, rebellious, disobedient to Allah. In Surah Al-Nur, verse number four, there is no difference of opinion about the testimony of a sinful person. Narrations and speech from impudent and lewd Muslims. The topic of conveying speech in Islam is serious. Scholars reject narrations from people known to have sexual indecency with women. Ahl al-Hadith didn't accept reports mentioned from people who were dissolute. Whenever the scholars of Hadith wanted to record a person's reports, they would watch him. They would observe his prayer, character, and appearance. And see, my brothers, today we aren't able to observe these people. These people, what they do is they come as 
YouTube influencers, okay? And they build up a following. They hit the hundreds, thousands of subscriptions, followers. And when they get to that point, it's so hard to criticize them because their following has gained an affinity towards them, my brothers. So we have to be on the lookout. People who were lewd and acted foolish were avoided. Ibn al-Mundar used to love Sufyan ibn Uyayna. He was considered a scholar of hadith. Ibn al-Mundar had strong feelings about Abdul Wahid al thaqafi He used to flirt with women in the street. The king of Basra exiled Ibn al-Mundar from the city. His character was lewd and he used to play pranks on other Muslims. Ibn Mundar used to unleash scorpions at the Kaaba so that they could sting people. During the night, he would pour ink at the wudu station so the people's faces would turn black. For those reasons, no one narrated from him. It's no exaggeration to say the first three people mentioned have major character flaws. Now how do we deal with some others? News and broadcast from anonymous and unnamed reporters. This is what's important here. I want us to apply this. Knowing the narrators is an extensive topic in the books for Hadith lingo. Having anonymous reporters in the chain is among the quickest approach to reject the Hadith, meaning we don't know the status of the narrator. This topic defines the identity of narrators' names, fathers, grandfathers, and so forth. The subject for lineage, region, birth dates, and death plus more are also included in this subject, my brothers. People writing on forums need to identify themselves by their kunya or their first name so that you can know who they are. After mentioning those names, they state their father name followed by their surname. So how is it that we stay tested with unknown tweeters? Names like Akavar Ox, Unknown Ox, Sunnah to the Bone, and other false lineages. These kinds of names lead us to classify the people as being anonymous mubhim. Nameless reporters aren't accepted even as well. If the person narrating on him mentions him as being thiqa, for example, you say that such and such is a trustworthy person, but he's trustworthy to you, but maybe not to the other, that doesn't mean he's trustworthy for others to accept him. Let's get to the facts here. Whenever a scholar or a person says a trustworthy person told me such and such, it's a must that the person's name be mentioned. Otherwise, he's anonymous as well as being, be as well because he might be viewed as being trustworthy with one scholar, but his reality may be totally different. Imam al-Shafi'i used to narrate hadith using the word, a trustworthy person informed me. Sometimes he was referring to Imam Malik or Imam Ahmad, but at other times he was referring to Ibrahim ibn Abi Yahya. Imam al-Nisa'i said Ibrahim ibn Abi Yahya is a liar. There are many reasons for this, but perhaps the most applicable cause relates to homeland. It's a general rule that the people from their country know their citizens the best. Yahya ibn Ma'in considered Abdurrahman ibn Mu'awiyah al-Madani a trustworthy man. Imam Malik held him to be unreliable. Imam Malik's speech takes precedence over Ibn Ma'in as he was from Medina and knew Abdurrahman better. The next point is the spread of information from unknown narrators. Any narrator is unknown when there isn't any praise or criticism from a scholar with his name. Whenever a person is praised or criticized from a scholar, this removes them from being unheard of. Unheard of people who retell reports on religious events, scholars, fatwa, need to be identified. In contrast, if someone reliable conveys the same report, then we accept it. So my brothers, being known or unknown isn't restricted to a few individual scholars. In fact, there are reports where scholars were unaware of others who were well known. An example of this relates to Ibn al-Hazm's speech about Imam al-Tirmidhi being unknown. So for example, you might have that a person 
We might not know who he is, but that doesn't mean he's completely unknown. He might just be unknown to us. <coughs> a person is unknown when he names himself with a name, a nickname, or a description which he isn't known for. Moreover, if the person isn't known for seeking knowledge or if the scholars don't know him, then we classify him as meshul ayn, mean he's unknown and specific. Ibn Hajjah said about the meshul ayn person is like the unnamed reporter. His narration isn't accepted until someone attests to the trustworthiness of his religion. Clearly the invention of news stories share harm in Muslims' honor today. The mass spread of information retweeted or liked on Facebook has accelerated the spread of destruction of trust and Muslims' honor exponentially. By implementing the guidelines from Ahlul Hadith, my brothers, we can reduce the spread of injury and abuse. The propagandist potential to spread misinformation on an unprecedented scale must be sidelined. Their reports must be written with their forgotten voices, their oral context, in whatever mediums they survive must remain in question. We must protect our tongues and set aside all broadcast from liars and noted sinners. This not only preserves the honors of others, but also safeguards our tongues. Allah said, not a word does he or she utter, but there is a watcher by him ready to record it in Surah Al-Qaf number 18. So be on alert when spreading news. Only accept reports from people you are certain who are upright and honest in character and speech. Avoid all social media accounts from people you are unfamiliar with. Stay clear on letting your tongue loose with stories from anonymous accounts. You can't be certain if what they are saying is true or if they are spinning some yawn. Protect your beliefs and your tongue. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, two before the one who protects his tongue. Collect it and compiled by Abu Ali Abdullah bin Dwight Battle in Doha, Qatar, 1436. I pray that, inshallah, there was some benefit in this, but this is something I've been trying to fight against for the last <coughs> five or six years. It's become a pandemic that 